You know, I like to say when I begin these conversations that I am a proud, I am a patriotic, and these days I am a pissed off American citizen. Oh good. I am so glad that it always makes me happy when that is the reaction I get because I'll tell you something, folks, I am also very proud to say that I will self-identify as a political progressive. And I personally think that we as progressives have made a mistake by allowing the Tea Party to claim some sort of monopoly on political anger in this country. Because, yeah. you know, I've had conversations with Tea Party supporters and Tea Party adherents, and when you talk to them and actually ask them, like, what are you angry about? And, and you actually engage them in, a, in an honest conversation, what i found nine times out of ten, they'll tell you, well, I'm angry that Wall Street America and big bankers destroyed the economy, and then our federal government gave them a trillion dollars. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm angry about that, too, aren't you? Yes. And I don't want the Tea Party to be the only place where that political anger is expressed. Because I'll tell you another thing. I'm also angry about the fact that 25% of the children are going to bed hungry in the United States of America. And I don't hear that anger expressed at Tea Party rallies. I'm angry about the fact that one in six American families, the richest country the world has ever seen, one in six of our families are living in poverty. I don't hear that anger expressed at Tea Party rallies. And I'm angry about the fact that the economic institutions of our country, especially the transnational corporations, are destroying the planet that we depend upon for life itself, causing a runaway global climate crisis. And I damn sure don't hear that expressed at Tea Party rallies. And I'll tell you something, folks. The anger that I'm describing to you, I want to... I want to really come to terms with the fact that that anger that I'm describing, that I'm sensing from you, you share, let's acknowledge that that is a righteous anger. Yeah. It is a righteous anger. It, it's not typical anger. You know, if you just get angry about something and then you just stew in it and wallow in it, that's a very dangerous thing. It's dangerous emotionally, psychologically, physically, spiritually. Righteous anger is something different. You see, righteous anger requires action. And here it's right, there's something different there. It was righteous anger that actually propelled those abolitionists in this country to be able to stand up against that depraved institution. It was righteous anger that allowed those women to get together at Seneca Falls to begin the process, finally, of trying to dismantle the patriarchal institutions of this country. It was righteous anger that help to fuel the trade union movement, the civil rights movement in this country. Righteous anger is a good thing. Yeah. 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 It is a good thing, and we should actually own that. And I'll also say something else, folks. I'm also angry and sad because I can remember what it was like to say that I was a proud and patriotic American without any other qualifier. Yeah. <laughs> and for me personally, that's when I was a little boy. <laughs> When I was taught that I was from the United States of America, and it was the land of the free and the home of the brave, and I was so proud of that, and not only that, but the United States of America stood for liberty and justice and equality. And not only that, but the United States of America was like some great shining light on the hill, and it was going to guarantee liberty and justice and equality for everybody on the world. And I was so very proud of that. And I'm angry, folks, because I grew up and realized I had been lied to. <laughs> and so I think it's important to recognize, though, that it's not, when I say I was lied to, it's not the typical kind of lie. Because I actually have a, a face and a name that I associate with what I'll now call the creation myth of this country. And for me, that face, that name is Mrs. Armstrong. She was my fifth grade teacher. <laughs> Serious. And now let me ask very quickly, uh, are there any former, current, or to-be public teachers in the crowd? Would you raise your hand, please? Can we get a round of applause for our public teachers? And I mean that seriously. Thank you. I ask that round of applause for two very important reasons. Number one, I don't think that we acknowledge and applaud public teachers in this country often enough. I mean, we damn sure don't pay them enough money. But the second reason I asked for that round of applause is in honor of Mrs. Armstrong. Because when I say that she was 
perpetrating a creation myth on me, I want to be very clear. Mrs. Armstrong did not go to bed at night saying, I can't wait till those little children come into my classroom so I can fill their mind full of lies and propaganda. No! Mrs. Armstrong was a good woman and she was a public school teacher and she became a public school teacher because she wanted to help children to become productive members of society. You see, Mrs. Armstrong taught that creation myth because she believed it. And it worked on me, it worked on my classmates, and I can tell by the reaction, the nonverbal feedback I'm getting from this crowd, it worked on virtually every one of you here. And you know why it worked on me and you and all of us? Because we wanted to believe it. We wanted it so much. You see, I would submit to you that it is our birthright. We want to live in liberty and justice and equality. And may I suggest to you that we want those things not because we're Americans. We want those things because we're human beings. Absolutely American children want liberty, justice, and equality. And you know what? So do Iraqi children and Afghani children, and Jewish children, and Palestinian children, and Mexican children, and Senegalese children, may I suggest to you that that is the human condition. And I actually want us to begin to talk about and think about this movement, much as Bill did in the introduction, to recognize the connections between Arab Spring, and not just in the Middle East and Northern Africa, but what's spreading throughout Latin America. There is a worldwide democracy movement that's going on now, and as Americans, may I suggest that we actually ought to have a little humility, that we ought to actually recognize that the Global South is actually so much further ahead of us in terms of how to actually confront and grapple with some of these big issues that they are coming to terms with, and if we will actually be respectful and have a little humility and be a little humble and learn from them that we might actually begin the process of making the United States of America the country that we were promised it was, but it really isn't. So another thing I want to say is to recognize something that's coming out of uh, the research for human beings and how we understand the world and how we know what we know. Epistemology is the word. And how we know what we know, how we understand the world, the most important thing is not facts. The most important thing is the stories we tell each other. So really and truly, I actually want to just sort of frame this out by saying, I think today what I'm going to try to do is tell a story. I'm going to tell the story of how it came to be that these large transnational corporations have literally hijacked every institution of this country and how corporations are not just exercising power today, but they are ruling us. Large transnational corporations are ruling us because they're making the public fundamental policy decisions that affect all of our lives. They're deciding how much poison will be in the water that we're all drinking and the air that we're all breathing. Corporate CEOs are deciding what our transportation choices will be. Corporations are deciding what health care we'll get, or really what health care we won't get normally. Um, but they are making these fundamental public policy decisions and for the most part we're left to choose between paper or plastic at the grocery store. We can choose between an infinite number of consumer choices, right? But if you really get down to, well, how would you like your society structured, we are virtually never given actual opportunities to participate in that except when we create them ourselves. And at the risk of sounding uh, sycophantic, may I just actually honor, acknowledge that well was one of the very first places in the United States that I was aware of where an organizational structure began to facilitate those kind of conversations and actually asked that into implementing. So uh, uh, that is an honest, you know, for a sincere acknowledgement of the fact that y'all really were ahead uh, at well and that many of the rest of us are, are trying to catch up and, and have that same experience. So listen, in order to tell this story, I'm going to make sure that we cover four topics together, all right? The first topic is the word democracy. That word gets tossed around a lot in the United States of America. And so in order to make sure we've got some clarity, let me ask this question. What language is that from? Greek. It's from Greek. Good. So let's break it down together. Demos means? The people. Kratia means? Rule. <laughs> 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 
It means rule or power. So literally the word democracy means the people rule. So that begs the question, how many people believe we the people are ruling in the United States? Don't be shy. Look around. Not a single person raised their hand in this crowd. I do this presentation all across the country. It is rare that anybody will even tentatively say, well, kind of, sort of, maybe. And let me tell you something, folks. That's a problem. But I'll tell you something else. The fact that nobody's raising their hands to that question is also a good thing. It's not a good thing that we're not ruling in this country, but it is a good thing that we are finally acknowledging it, that we are finally actually coming to terms with the fact that we were taught a creation myth about democracy in the United States of America, that we were actually sold a bill of goods. And instead of just wallowing in that, though, maybe we ought to actually go about the business of making that promise a reality. Now, that will lead me to my second topic I want to make sure we cover, which is sovereignty. Can anybody give me a two or three word definition there? Or how about this? If I just had the word the sovereign, if I just said the sovereign, who or what would you think of? A king. A king. And that's because the word sovereignty means who has the authority to rule. And the reason that you think of, and so many of us think of king or the king, is because 500 years ago, the word sovereign and king were literally synonymous. The king was the sovereign. The sovereign was the king. Oh, and by the way, where did the king get his authority to rule? God. You don't get more legitimate. Right? In fact, to really illustrate this point, I'm going to ask you to indulge me in a little exercise. This is always a lot of fun. For me. <laughs> You'll see. I will invite this Grange Hall to please close your eyes and repeat after me. After me. David Cobb is the king. <laughs> I told y'all this was fun for me. No king. And as the king, David is God's representative on earth. And therefore, everything David says must be obeyed. Okay, y'all can open your eyes now. Let me just acknowledge something real quick. When we first started that little exercise, all of y'all laughed. Did you notice that? There was like a collective chuckle. And, and you know why, of course? Because that's funny. I mean, not funny as in, oh, David has just made a very droll and witty comment. Not that kind of funny. Stupid funny. I mean, what, what comedians call absurd humor. I mean, it's absurd to say that I can tell this fella how to live his life because who my parents are, right? I mean, that's really what that means. Or even better, that I should say how all of society gets to be organized. Like, that's ridiculous. That's absurd. That is laughable. And 500 years ago, human beings just like me and you not only said it, but they believed it. And I want to really let that sink in for a moment, folks. 500 years is a blink of an eye in human history. And 500 years ago, human beings assumed absolutely, it was true without a shadow of a doubt that the king was sovereign and that the king's authority to rule came directly from God and that was an unquestioned reality. Let me tell you something, folks. Bill did acknowledge I'm a Green Party member. I'm proud of that. But I'm also proud to tell you I have frequently worked in coalition with Democrats. Um, Big shout out to Norman Solomon. I hope you all come out and see my friend Norman. Uh, I have also, though, on particular issues, I have worked with uh, Republicans during the Anti-Patriot Act work that I did. Uh, there were many Libertarians and Republicans that I worked shoulder to shoulder with. I've also worked with Socialists, Communists, Anarchists. I've worked with a lot of different folks, right? I have, I have a long history of working in coalition. Now, I don't say that so you'll pat me on the back. I say that so you'll understand this. In my 30 years of social justice work, where I've looked for opportunities to work in coalition with folks, I have never had the privilege, the opportunity, to work with a monarchist. <laughs> right? I mean, in other words, it, it, again, even though you've heard the joke already, even saying monarchist makes you chuckle and laugh. We can't even say that out loud without laughing about it. And yet 500 years ago, that's all there was. And I guess what I'm asking us to do is consider this. When people tell me that amending the Constitution is too hard, 
or we can't do that because it's too big a lift. I think, have you not been paying attention? The kind of systemic change that, that we really so desperately need if we're going to navigate peak oil and if we're going to navigate the end of modern industrialism and, and usher in a new way of being, it's actually not only required, but we can do this, y'all. I mean, this has been done before. These kind of changes have been made before. Another way to say it, y'all uh, get ready. The Texan going to get metaphysical on y'all. <laughs> ready? We are all individually participating in creating our collective reality. Another, another way to say that is, if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it's true, right? Literally. So we should really begin to act, acknowledge that. And if it is true that we live in a racist, sexist, class oppressive society, and that our economic institutions are destroying the planet, and it is, then honestly, folks, we all individually have a level of complicity in that. We are helping to create and perpetuate that. So that will lead me to the next topic I want to make sure we cover, which is legal personhood. Now, you'll notice I haven't put corporate personhood here, but legal personhood. That's because I want us to understand that the very concept of legal personhood means the ability to assert rights under law. So if you can assert your rights under law, that is a, a way to describe that is legal personhood. And in fact, the definition of who gets to be a legal person has been one of the fundamental struggles within the, throughout the entire history of the United States. Who can assert rights? And what it means to be a person is a lens by which we can look at U.S. history, and it's a very important one. And the last concept I want to make sure that we cover is the corporation. And because that word is also so important, let me ask the same question. What language is this from? Latin. This one is from Latin. Let's break it down. Corpus means? Body. body. That's right. And now for extra credit, any Latin scholars, the suffix T-I-O-N? <laughs> Sean! No, it's, it actually means to have or create. So literally, the word corporation means to have or create body. And by body, I mean literally a physical body. And that's because in law school, by the way, any lawyers in the crowd besides me that would admit it? <laughs> this is a friendly crowd, y'all. All right, well... That's because in law school, we are taught that a corporation is a legal fiction. In fact, in fact, that concept, that phrase is so popular that even though nobody's been to law school here, here's an honest question. If you have heard the phrase, even if you're not exactly sure what it means, but if you've heard the phrase that a corporation is a legal fiction, raise your hand. Look at all those hands go up, right? So a corporation is a legal fiction. That kind of begs the question, what does the word fiction mean? <laughs> Not true. Made up. So a corporation literally doesn't exist. And that's what we're taught in law school. Corporation doesn't really exist. But we're going to pretend like this group of people who are coming together to do certain things and these contracts that they make with one another and these obligations, that these concepts, we're going to pretend like it's one thing so we can treat it under law, right? And of course, if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it's true. It's true. Poof, presto changeo. We just created a corporation. A corporation is a legal construct. That is, it is constructed by us collectively pretending like it, it is one thing. And the word corporation comes from Latin because the first corporations ever created by the genius of human imagination was actually created during the Roman Republic. Not, by the way, during the Roman Empire. And sometimes I wish we spent more time asking, what happens when, when a republic devolves into an empire? Because that might be an important conversation in the United States. <laughs> Just saying, you know, planting seeds. Just planting seeds. But the Roman, the corporations were first created during the Roman Republic for a reason. And that is to do certain things. For example, have y'all heard the phrase, all roads lead to Rome? Yes. Right? Very famous adage. Well, that, that road system was actually designed by and created 
by a Roman corporation. Likewise, the, fir the aqueduct system, that amazing bit of architecture that moved water all across the Italian peninsula, it was actually designed by and operated as a Roman corporation. Likewise, the first universities, Roman corporation. The first hospitals, can y'all guess? Roman corporation. So here's a quick question. What does a road system, a water system, a university, a hospital, what do they all have in common? They're all public. They all serve the public good. The genius of this idea of a corporation is to create an entity and an organization to be able to take private money and to put it to public use. But now there's another way that, gov that government will take private money. What's that called? Taxes. Taxes. Now let me tell you something, folks. I'm not here to denigrate taxes at all. In fact, uh, have y'all heard that we're in a budget crisis in the United States? <laughs> Y'all heard we're in a budget crisis in California? Y'all yeah. might have heard that Mendocino County has a budget crisis? Yeah. It's not true. It is an allocation crisis. It's not a budget crisis. More money has been created by this economy nationally in the state of California than has ever been created ever in the history of humanity. You want to solve every single budget crisis or so-called budget crisis? Three word solution. Y'all probably know it. Let's say it together. Tax the rich. Problem solved. So I'm not, I think, yeah, you can applaud that. I wish you'd be a little more comfortable. I wish you'd be a little more comfortable talking about taxing the rich. So I'm not here to denigrate taxes, but I am here to point out that taxes are, are, are something that are required of us. I mean, after all, when the tax person shows up, does, does the tax man say, uh, it's time to pay taxes. Would you be, please be willing to pay? No. <laughs> or, or what could we do to entice you maybe to be willing to pay? No, taxes are mandatory. The genius of the corporation is to say, would you either be willing to give a voluntary donation of your private money to this public service, or could we entice you with a, perhaps a return on your investment? The genius of the corporation is that it took voluntary private money, material, etc., and put it to a public use. And that is a genius idea. Do not let it be said that David Cobb is anti-corporation. Do not let it be said that the Move to Amend Coalition is anti-corporation. The idea of the corporation as a construct has been put to enormous, successful, positive things in our history, in world history in the past. But of course, the problem is that the modern transnational corporation doesn't exactly operate that way, does it? <laughs> and that, my friends, is because the modern transnational corporation actually comes out of the 15th and 16th century of Europe. You know, the age of discovery. <laughs> I have to put discovery in quotation marks because what did they discover? And for that matter, who was they? When they discovered, who was they in that sentence? Europeans. And what did they discover? Africa, Asia, later North and South America. Newsflash! There were people living there! They weren't lost. They didn't need to be discovered. And so, let's get somber for a moment because I think that we really need to come to terms with and tell the truth an ugly truth. The age of discovery is not the age of discovery at all. It is the age of rape, and pillage, and plunder, and murder. There's one word, I think, that actually captures it. Empire. Reformation. It's empire. And empire means to beat people down, to crush them, to kill them if you have to, to steal their resources and suck it in. That's what imperialism is. And the transnational corporation that we understand today was created during the same epoch of that age of empire, and it weren't an accident. In fact, to put a fine point on it, the modern transnational corporation was created intentionally and deliberately as an instrument of empire. In fact, one of the earliest corporations was a little outfit called the East India Company, which was specifically designed to legalize the hegemony and the subjugation of the entire Indian continent and then to allow a military junta to rule over those previously free and proud people. Another of the early corporations was the 
Africa Trading Company. Would anybody like to guess what the Africa Trading Company traded? Thank you, sir. Say that louder. People. Because I'll just use myself as an example here. I know that whenever I just do this presentation and I say, what did the Africa Trading Company trade? If I'm not really conscious, you know what word pops into my head? Un unbidden by me. The word that pops into my head? Slaves. Yep. And may I say, and own it for myself, when that word pops into my head, that's an example of my own colonialization. My mind has been colonized. I've been taught to think that. Because, th what's your first name, sir? David. David. So it's David who answers the question, people, thank you, David, because it begs the question, was Africa populated by slaves? <laughs> no. Africa was populated by people. And may I say, people basically just like me. And I say that with clear understanding of my own pigment, right? I'm not stupid, but people just like me, because if you ask any scientist, if you ask any biologist, they will tell you race does not exist. Oh, sure, skin pigment exists, even ethnicity exists, but no scientist would elevate those sorts of things to a classification or a taxonomy. Right? So race doesn't exist, but check this out. Racism damn sure does. How can that possibly be? Why, if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it's, it's true. <laughs> Boom. Presto changeo, we've just created race. Race is a construct, just as surely as the corporation is a construct. And the reason that I'm going down this particular intellectual uh, avenue and asking us to think about this is to really understand that the transnational corporation and imperialism and racism are inextricably linked. And I am not the first American to observe that because one of the great American political thinkers and orators of all time said basically the same thing in what I believe is his best political speech. It's not this gentleman's most famous speech because his most famous speech is known as I have a dream. Who am I talking about? Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King, that's right. But Martin Luther King, and I Have a Dream is a beautiful speech, y'all. It really is, and it deserves to be heard and learned, and, and we, we should think about it. And his best political speech was not delivered in Washington, D.C. at all. It was instead delivered in Harlem at the Riverside Church. That speech is known as Beyond War or Beyond Vietnam. And I'm seeing several of you know this speech that I'm talking about, and in that speech, that Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., who was a preacher, said the United States of America is suffering from a spiritual and moral decay because of the triple evils, and that's a strong word for a man of faith, the triple evils of racism, militarism, and extreme materialism. And he said, unless and until the United States comes to terms with these evils, we can never become the country that we are designed and destined to be. And you know what, folks? King was right then, and he's right now. Unless and until we actually confront racism, militarism, and extreme materialism or greed run amok, we are not going to be able to transition. And so, since I finally got us to the United States in this long story that I'm telling, but here's a question. How many original colonies in the United States? 13. 13. That was a gimme, y'all. Yeah. So here's the real question. How many of those original 13 colonies were actually corporations? 13. 13. It was a trick question. 13. And that's because it took the king to create them, to create the body. The king created Massachusetts. Now somebody might say, uh-uh, Massachusetts was already there. But that's why it's a trick question. The land was there, the people who lived on the land, and the deer, and the rivers, and the streams, and the fish, and the birds. You know, reality? <laughs> reality was there, but it took the king to create Massachusetts. Right? And the king created Massachusetts by the use of a document known as a charter. That's right. 
And the charter is a legal document to create it. And the way that works, and let's do another little exercise in order to illustrate how this would work. And in our little exercise now, I'll be the king. And why do you think I might be the king? Because I'm telling the story. <laughs> so I'll be the king. And as the king, I will now create Massachusetts by a legal document. And now, David, I'm going to make you governor. Watch this. I, the king, with all the power and authority from God on high, will now create a new entity known as Massachusetts and will appoint David to be the royal governor. And now watch this. I'm going to quote directly from the actual original charter of Massachusetts. Quote, to plant, to rule, and to govern this new area on my behalf for my benefit and to benefit the shareholders of the Massachusetts Bay Trading Company. The Charter of Massachusetts created a joint stock company to begin with. To plant, to rule, and to govern this new area. And, you know, there's another way that we would think of in modern times this governor who is responsible to the, the shareholders of the joint stock company. In today's terminology, how would we think of our governor? CEO. So I'm suggesting to you folks that the American Revolution is not merely a rejection of monarchy as a form of rule. It is that, but it is also a people's uprising against corporate rule. There is a level at which if we just look at the history of the United States, one of the things that we see is a people's uprising against these illegitimate entities known as corporations. Another way to say that, folks, is that the American revolutionaries were not calling for a more socially responsible king. <laughs> and so perhaps today we might think about doing something more than just asking for more socially responsible corporations. Because I don't know about you, but I'm over it. I am tired of collecting all of the science and all the data that shows that there are cancer clusters around these particular corporations. And so please, corporation, would you please not actually cause quite so much cancer? <laughs> or even better, Massey Coal Company, would you please not kill quite so many coal miners in your everyday operations? Or British Petroleum Corporation, would you please not to destroy the entire frigging Gulf of Mexico? I mean, is that really all we want? A little less death? A little less destruction? Can't we raise our aspirations higher? Yeah. Don't we actually imagine something different than that? And honestly, yeah, please applaud that, right? Please let's actually recognize that this movement really is about something more than just what we are taught we are allowed to do. Because the American Revolution, our legacy, our legacy really is very powerful, the ability to actually begin to think differently. And honestly, folks, it's time for us to think as differently, as differently as the revolutionaries were, because it's really interesting. I say that those people, the American revolutionaries, were not calling for a more socially responsible king, and that is true, but 10 years before the revolution, those people who would become revolutionaries, they were actually writing letters to the king that went something like this. Oh, dear Father King, we, your humble and obedient children, come before you on bended knee to ask that you intervene on our behalf because your royal governor is passing unfair laws. Yes, taxation without representation, but mostly complaints about trade laws and business laws that are unfairly advantaging the East India Company and other of the large corporations at our expense. So please, Father, as good, obedient Englishmen, intervene on our behalf. <laughs> it was the most sniveling, groveling language you can imagine. And I don't know about you, but I am keenly interested in asking what kind of conversations were those folks having with one another that convinced them to stop the boot kissing to actually find the wherewithal to get up off their knees and to actually stand up 
to put their shoulders back, to put their chin up and look directly at the king. And where did the king claim his power? God. And to know that that was the cultural reality, to look behind the king and see the most powerful military the world had ever seen before and said, you're done, get out, we're doing it different. Because let me tell you something, folks, that experience, doing that, is magic. The ability, and, it's, and I want to be clear, just standing up against illegitimate power alone is not magic. If one brave woman or man stands up against oppression, that deserves to be appreciated and applauded. But if one person stands up, she or he will be either ignored or crushed. Yep. Just like that. Yep. The magic happens when one person stands up and somebody next to them and next to them and next to them and next to them. And the next thing you know, you've got an entire group of people. Because when that magic happens, culture has shifted. A whole different way, a whole different way of thinking and a whole different way of acting has happened. And that's magic. And I do believe that Bill is right. Something magical is happening on a worldwide basis now. A recognition that there is a small ruling elite in every damn country. Right? And they don't have any allegiance to us. And, and they have no allegiance to, to, to the, the peons, to the rabble. And the magical thing is that we're figuring out a way to actually get together. And I will say this, for all the critiques that we may have about them, let us just say, God bless Occupy Wall Street. Yeah. And God bless the occupiers everywhere in this country who have reminded us of that incredible power. Because yes, they're occupying public space. That's an amazing thing. But really what they're doing is occupying imagination space. And they're actually challenging us. They're daring us to actually imagine a different way of being. And they're not even pretending like they've got all the answers, but they got some damn good questions. Uh, an idea whose time has come. An idea whose time has come. So, now that I've finally gotten our little story to the United States of America, and I've talked about the king getting thrown out, we know the king gets thrown out, so a new government gets put in its place. A new way of governing in the United States. It's no longer the king. So, a new government gets put in its place. What is that document called? The U.S. Constitution. So here's an honest question, y'all. How many people in this crowd have read the U.S. Constitution? Raise your hand. All right, lots of hands go up. That's good. So I'm going to ask y'all to grade my papers. Y'all see if I get this right, because I will submit this to you, folks. If you look at the U.S. Constitution and look at the entire document, you will see basically two actors or, or two main concepts. The first concept is the most important concept. It's so important, in fact, it's the first three words. All I have to do is put my hand to my ear everywhere in this country, and folks will say in unison, we the people. And that's because these are hallowed words in this country, and they should be. Because we the people come together to create the second concept, which is government. And I want to really underscore that the people create government. Government in this model does not pre-exist the people. The people are actually creating government. We the people in this document are described as being free and sovereign. And what does the word sovereign mean again? The authority to rule. We the people are claiming the authority to rule. The king is no longer sovereign. We the people are. And watch this. Government is not sovereign. Government does not have the authority to rule. In fact, to the contrary, government is subordinate and accountable. Government is subordinate to whom? The people. The people. Government is accountable to whom? The people. The people. That's kind of got a ring to it, doesn't it? I like how this is going. Let's continue. We the people are free and sovereign because we have rights. Government does not have rights over the people. Government has duties. The difference between rights and duties is profound. You see, if you have the right to do something, it means you can just do it. And if I have the right to do something, I don't need David's permission. I don't need this group's permission. I don't need to go to the city council of Willits to ask political permission. I don't need the state of California's permission. Look, y'all, I'm from Texas. I don't need my mama's permission. <laughs> if I have a right to do something, it means I can damn well do it. 
And get this, if I have a right, it means that if government tries to infringe upon my rights, government's wrong, not me. And those rights, may I suggest, come from, and y'all don't get alarmed, it's just going to be one button. <laughs> Hold on. Can y'all see in the back? I'm pointing at my belly button. <laughs> if you're too shy to check here in this public place, go home tonight in the privacy of your own home. Check and make sure you've got a belly button. Because if you do, you too are a human being with rights under our Constitution. And I want to be clear, the Constitution does not create those rights. The Constitution recognizes those rights. They are inherent rights. They are inalienable rights. You have those rights because you're a human being. That's all. And government only has duties but never rights. And where do these duties come from, by the way? Well, think of it this way. All power resides with the people. That is a, all power is with the people. That's a very powerful idea. In fact, it's a revolutionary idea. That's the American Revolutionary said. So too did the Black Panthers, by the way. In, in fact, that's right. That's, they would start every meeting that way. And think about this. This is a group of people who are being systematically repressed by virtually every one of the institutions that they were living in. And when they would start a political meeting, whoever was facilitating the meeting would say those words. They would be repeated. Then they'd go about their business. I think those words are magic, too. And in order to illustrate that, I will invite you to just try it with me. You don't have to, but if you're willing to, I'll say that and ask you to repeat it. I'll say, power to the people. Power to the people. I'll do it again. Power, power to the people. Power to the people. Every time I do this, hands go up in the air, right? So you know who did it. I see you. And look, everybody look around. Look around at each other really quick, really quick. John do you Lennon see? Said, John Lennon said, power to the people right off. <laughs> so I wanted to really recognize Everybody is smiling right now. I honestly think that this idea of power to the people makes us feel good. It makes us feel good to recognize that we collectively have power together is a profound understanding and it makes us feel really human and wonderful and it is a beautiful thing to celebrate and I will celebrate it. And I'll also say this, how many, what is the population of uh, Mendocino County? 90,000 more or less. I will celebrate that 90,000 uh, folks within Mendocino County have all the political power, and that is a wonderful thing. But you know what? I do not want to go to the meeting where 90,000 people come together to decide where the stop signs go. <laughs> right? And I like political meetings. I'm not going to that one. That's because, yes, we have all the political power collectively, but we delegate a certain amount of our power to the instrument entity of government. Mm -hmm. How much power do we delegate to government? Only enough to perform the duties that we the people have already said that they should do. Think of it this way. The Constitution is supposed to codify our social contract. And some of us think, and I'll own it right up front, it may be time to renegotiate the social contract. <laughs> we'll get to that. But all power resides with the people. And the people also, though, individually have rights. So in our private realm, we have rights. But there's also a public realm. So there is both a civil libertarian, don't tread on me aspect, and a communitarian aspect. The constitutional framework is actually sort of brilliant that way. And one way that I like to actually think about it is this. So. In the framework of the Constitution, as we are taught, all power resides with the people. The people are actually sovereign with the authority to rule ourselves. We individually have rights that are sacrosanct. We delegate a certain amount of, of our power to government, and government is responsible at the local, state, or federal level to make the laws to facilitate uh, the kind of world that we're supposed to live in. However, government is always accountable to the collective will of the body, and the one thing that government can never do as they're discharging their duties is to violate any private citizen's rights. And if a law violates your rights, you as an individual can and should be able to go into court and overturn that law. Do you see how that works? Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that brilliant? We should try that in this country. This would work. And I'm not even joking. 
I do think this is a brilliant concept. The problem is not, Mrs. Armstrong was right to be proud about this. The problem is not in this framework. The problem is in its implementation. Because before I go one second further, waxing poetic about how beautiful and brilliant the US Constitution is, time out. <laughs> Somebody tell me what year this document actually gets created in the United States, comes into being as the United States of America. 1789, they, 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 it's ratified in 1789. So that's like after the Constitutional Convention. 1789. The reason that I wanted a date certain up here so I could ask this very important question. In 1789, who gets to be a legal person? Property, right property owners, but what kind of property right owners? Right. White male property right. owners. So literally, if you're not a man, you're not fully a person under law. If you're not white, you're not a person. Three yes. Is that why the peep in people is capitalized? Uh, no, I don't think that's why the people is, is, is capitalized. But the point that I am trying to make is who gets to be a legal person is a very important question. In fact, what percentage of the adult U.S. population living in those 13 colonies that are now 13 states, what percentage of them were actually legally persons? 1%. 1%? That's it. That's it. 99%. That's cute. 1%. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, that's, that's, that's ridiculous. Only 1%? No, don't be so cynical. It's 5%. <laughs> really, y'all. 5% of the adult human beings living here in the creation of this country were actually legally persons. So there's another, way to there's another way to express this fraction, of course. 95% of the adult human beings were not legally persons with the ability to participate in this framework. Another way to say this is that for all this beautiful rhetoric, and it is beautiful rhetoric, but for all this beauty, there is an ugliness to the reality that this is a founding violence. It's obviously a violence against the indigenous human beings who were already here and were subject to intentional, deliberate genocide. And that's the truth, and it needs to be told. It is also a founding violence against women. Because it's not just that women couldn't vote. I mean, that's the least of it. Women couldn't own property. Women were property. By any reasonable understanding of that word, they were chattel. Their whole legal rela uh, re reality was a function of their relationship with men in their lives. It's also... Of course, a founding violence against the Africans who were brought at the barrel of a gun, at the point of a spear, and forced to build this country. This country was built by slave labor. The White House that Barack Obama yeah. occupies was built by enslaved Africans. That truth needs to be told. And it's a founding violence against most of the white men. Because most of the white men were not sufficient property owners. Most of the white men were either indentured servants themselves or, at the very least, second-class citizens. So I say this, that these truths, these truths need to be told not so that we can wallow in guilt. I have no use for guilt. Guilt is a useless emotion unless and until it provokes future conduct. Here's a little trick, y'all. If there is anything that you feel guilty about, stop doing it. <laughs> How about that? But I, tell the, I say that it's important that men have got to talk about sexism. White folks have got to talk about racism. We've got to start talking about class in this country, not to wallow in guilt, because I'm not interested in that. What I am interested in is justice. And I think Nelson Mandela of the great African National Congress, the, the great leader, actually was very important. He said, look, if you live in a fundamentally unjust situation, the most important thing to do is to create a truth and reconciliation process. You tell the truth so that you can reconcile that. Not so you can shame somebody or punish somebody, but so you can reconcile it, so you can move towards justice. Right? I'm interested in actually telling the truth in its entirety about our own history so that we can move past it. Because frankly, folks, history requires a lens to really understand it, to look back on it and understand it. Howard Zinn has said one of the most important lenses, and may the goddess rest Howard Zinn's soul. <laughs> 
Howard Zinn, <laughs> the great historian, said, one of the most important ways to understand American history is as a series of struggles by actual human beings to be defined as people with rights protected by our Constitution. Mm -hmm. That's so important, I'm going to say it again. The entire history of the United States can be seen as a series of struggles by actual human beings to be legal persons with rights that would be protected by our Constitution. So some people might say, all right, Cobb, you got a scathing indictment about imperialism of 500 years ago. But hey, man, women can vote. We got rid of slavery. It's all good. <laughs> to which I say, au contraire, mon frere. <laughs> it ain't all good. It ain't all good at all. And I think a big reason it ain't all good is because it's now time to reintroduce the idea of the corporation. Because if this framework is helpful, and I hope it is, is this kind of helpful to think yeah, about yeah. how our yeah, government yeah. is supposed to operate and how we are supposed to have rights as people, sure. yeah. individuals that government can't violate? So if this is helpful, it's worth asking, well, where would a corporation go on this? Because after all, the modern transnational corporation is the most dominant institution of our time. It's kind of important. Well, in order to answer, before we put it up there, let me ask this quick little pop quiz. What does it take to form a corporation in California today? Three people. Money. Little bit of money, not much. $35 to the Secretary of State, and as long as you have filled the paperwork out and your check clashes, what will the Secretary of State do? Give you a charter. Give you a charter. And literally rubber stamp that sucker, right? You'll get a charter. How long can your charter last today? Forever. Forever. What can you do with your corporation under the California Code? Does anybody know? Say it again. Anything legally permissible. That's literally a quote from the California corporate code. Some of us say, well, apparently if you're big and rich enough, apparently you can do illegal things. <laughs> but the point I'm making is this instrument known as a corporation today, they can be created almost at will, right? There's very little control that we really think of in any kind of meaningful way. And I say that now to say, would you like to hear what it took to create a corporation in 1789? Our history. Watch this. You had to get a bill introduced in the lower house of your state government, and that had to actually pass by a majority. Then it had to go to the upper house of the state senate, and it had to pass by a majority, and then the governor had to be willing to sign it. It was the functional equivalent of a state law. Has anybody besides me tried to lobby to get a law passed? Anybody? How hard is that? 18 months. Real damn hard. Uh, although, it's funny, I was doing the same presentation in Colorado, and a member of the Colorado State Legislature, and I was honored that he was there, but he said, well, actually, Cobb, it depends. A good bill really is hard to pass, but bad ones, <laughs> super easy. <Yeah. laughs> Point I'm making is the mechanics of even creating a corporation were very high. And, get this, the substance. In order to get the privilege, not the right, but the privilege of limited liability, you had to identify a public need that was not being met. Right. And if you were given the privilege of incorporation, do you know how long your corporate charter would typically last? One year, three years, five years? They were all very limited in duration. And at the end of that time period, the limited liability dissolved. You can keep doing business, but the special privileges you got as a corporation dissolved. And if you wanted to do it again, you had to go back through the process all over again. Oh, and by the way, even if you were within your specific time period and you did anything other than the very public need that you said that you were going to do, do you know what happened to your corporate charter? Revoked. Revoked. Corporate charters were revoked just for going outside the scope of what you said you'd do. Oh, and even if you were in that limited time period, even if you were doing the kind of business that you said you were going to do, if you were found to be acting outside the public interest in any way, causing harm, you know, like deforestation or you know any of the number of things that we can think of that are done today, do you know what could happen to your corporate charter? <laughs> corporate charters could be revoked. The point I'm making is, if we understand that a state governmental action is required to create a corporation and give it limited liability, 
that the corporate charter can be used to hold the corporation accountable, that that charter can describe the duties of what a corporation is. And if we understood that throughout world history, a corporation should only be allowed to exist if it actually serves the public interest, can you see that a corporation should be on this side of the line? <laughs> and so here we go, folks. When the U.S. Supreme Court says, oh no, we're going to say that a corporation should actually be considered a person with rights under the Constitution, it perverts the whole thing. That's the payoff. You see, I really want to underscore that when a corporate, corporate personhood is not just sort of an illogical idea, which it is. Corporate, corporate personhood is not just stupid, which it is. <laughs> corporate personhood may be one of the single linchpins for how the ruling elite have hijacked our entire country, yeah. our entire government, and they legalized it. Yeah. They legalized it. And as a lawyer, that particularly chaps my ass. Because, I hope that's not too vulgar. Check myself. I'm right on the edge. Back, hey, back up, back up a minute. It really makes me angry. And it does, though. It really makes me angry because I went to law school, naive young soul that I was, because I thought that you go to law school to become a lawyer and administer justice to make fairness happen. I know. Can, don't you feel sorry for that guy? Don't you feel sorry for that little boy who actually thought, you know, America, we can become a lawyer. But here's the thing. Like, this is the thing, y'all. There is a movement, actually, that is coming to terms with all of this. And I am so proud to be part of a movement that says, let's not be embarrassed about being proud of what America is supposed to be. Yeah. Let's actually relish it. Let's actually stand up for it and for what Mrs. Armstrong and whoever your Mrs. Armstrong was and say, yes, this is a brilliant idea and we're not going to let the ruling elite hijack it from us. We're not going to let them destroy the planet and then overturn laws because corporate personhood actually allows corporate lawyers to go into court and overturn democratically enacted laws that we work our butts off to try to get passed. And corporate personhood has allowed corporate lawyers to overturn environmental protection laws, to overturn worker safety laws, to overturn public health laws, and most recently, in the Citizens United case, to actually overturn campaign finance laws. Laws designed to protect the integrity of our elections. If we can't actually have an election process that we can actually meaningful participate in, we've got to admit it's over. <laughs> so here's the thing, it ain't over. It ain't over because there's a movement that's taking place. And that movement really is, I believe, called Move to Amend. It is a multiracial and multiethnic coalition of groups and individuals who have come together under the singular purpose of saying, we will amend our U.S. Constitution to make it clear that a corporation is not a person with rights and that money is not political speech.